Lord, we praise you for bringing us here tonight. We thank you for the breath in our lungs, God, and for all the manifold graces and mercies that you have poured out on us that we so often take for granted. As we go into your word tonight, I pray that your spirit will be present with us in this room and moving us in our hearts and stirring up our spirits so that by the time we conclude our study uh, at the end of this evening, we won't simply be puffed up with knowledge and we won't simply be even more knowledgeable about the Bible, but we will be transformed by your word and that not a single word that is spoken tonight will fall to the ground, God, but rather it will go down into our hearts. It will penetrate them, Lord, and it will shape them to be more like you. Help us be part of the solution that this world needs. Help us be part of the solution that our churches need. And help us ultimately, God, be part of the solution by being more like you. We love you, Lord. We praise you. To your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so uh, we're doing something a little bit different tonight. Uh, and that is because at long last we have finished the book of 1 Peter. Uh, Sean did a very good job leading us through 1 Peter. Um, and we went really in-depth. Right? I mean, that is a five-chapter-long book, and it took us six months to get through it. Um, I mean, that, that's pretty crazy. Like, it took us longer to get through 1 Peter than it took us to get through 1 Kings. And 1 Kings is 22 chapters long. Uh, but that's because, I mean, whenever, Sean, whenever I'd ask Sean to lead it, I told him to go as in-depth as he wants. Uh, and um, what we've been doing for quite some time, and y'all who have been with us for a while will know this, uh, we've been doing kind of this thing where, like, we're going through the Old Testament, Right? Uh, And in between each Old Testament book, we've been doing something a little bit different, right? So this really started, what, three or four years ago, uh, where we started going through the book of Judges, right? And then after we went through Judges, uh, I think we went through Ruth, actually, just because it kind of, it was a natural, it was a short book, so we didn't go to the New Testament. We went through Ruth, and then we went through 1 Samuel. And in between 1 and 2 Samuel, we went through, I want to say James. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we went to James, right? So a shorter book in the New Testament. Then we went through 2 Samuel. And then between 2 Samuel and 1 Kings, we went through, what did we go through then? Colossians. Oh, yeah. We went through Colossians, Colossians, right? And so we went back to the New Testament, went through Colossians. And then we went back and we went through 1 Kings. And then after 1 Kings, we went to 1 Peter. So we've kind of been alternating, right? And what we've done is we've been going through the history of the Old Testament, specifically books that people don't really study as in-depth as often. Uh, Mainly because that's really my heart behind all of this, right? I want us to be studying all scripture. And what I see in our churches is that we sometimes place a heavier emphasis on the New Testament than the Old. Uh, Whereas to me, uh, whenever I actually read scripture, it seems like the authors of scripture place a heavier emphasis on the Old than the New. It's like the New Testament is more like the appendix to the Old that basically explains all the stuff that was laid as the foundation in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so my heart behind this has been, I want us to go through and explore the text that people often don't look at as much. Um, but in between those texts, I don't want to just totally ignore the New Testament. Uh, and so um, usually either myself or one of y'all will lead us through a book in the New Testament that we find themes that tie into the stuff we've been talking about in the Old. Right? So that's kind of been the mentality. And Sean led us through First Peter. And one thing that I'm glad that he did is he took us very in-depth uh, just because I want us to always remember that you can always go more in-depth into Scripture. Right? We spent six months on First Peter, but believe it or not, there's a lot of stuff that we didn't even address in the book, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and so you could go even more in-depth than we went, and that's what you can do with all the texts of Scripture. Uh, we are going to be going into 2 Kings soon, uh, starting next week. This week, we're actually just going to be recapping, um, and that's because it's been a long time. Uh, but next week, we're going to start going into 2 Kings chapter 1, and our goal is to go a lot quicker, right? We're not going to be going nearly as in-depth into 2 Kings as we did in First Peter, or else we would be going through 2 Kings for the next probably five or six years. Uh, and we're just, you know, there's other stuff that we can study. And if you want to go that in depth, well, guess what? We're only meeting once a week. So you can go through the same chapter more in depth every other day of the week if you want. Um, and so uh, we're going to be going a little bit quicker and we're going to be just looking at the broader strokes of things. Uh, but hopefully the end goal is just to give you a better understanding of biblical history. Um, and so what we're going to do today uh, is we are going to uh, really just do a recap of Genesis through 1 Kings. Uh, just to basically catch us up to speed, um, and this is for several reasons. Uh, firstly, I just think it's always helpful to do a little reset and recap things. Um, just because the more that you repeat this stuff in your head, the more familiar you become with it and the more you're going to remember it, right? This is just a helpful thing when it comes to teaching. Repetition typically will breed better learning, right? The more you hear something, the more it's drilled into your head. Uh, and so if we can condense everything from Genesis to First Kings into a nice little like two-hour thing, 
Well, that's really good, right? Because we have spent years going through this, but we're kind of condensing it down and we're kind of looking at the big picture stuff and we're highlighting the big themes that you need to know, right? Uh, a second reason why we're doing this is because, once again, we spent six months in First Peter, right? We've spent six months looking at a letter that was written to um, scattered Christians in Asia Minor in the first century AD. And now we are jumping into a book that was that takes place a thousand years earlier, or, well, maybe a few hundred years earlier, right? It covers a few hundred years, right? So we were just spending six months looking at this one short little letter written to one specific community, and now we are jumping back hundreds of years to talk about something totally different. Uh, and so I think it's worthwhile to actually just spend some time breaking down the context, um, just because we're dealing with something totally different. And the last time we were even in this context was in March. Uh, and so it's just kind of helpful for us to kind of go back, reset things, just so that we kind of have the right um, head on our shoulders as we go into the study. And because, if I'm going to be entirely honest with you, even as somebody who is going to be leading us through this book, I'll be the first to admit that First and Second Kings are probably the hardest books to recall what happened uh, in, in the Bible. Right? Whenever you read First and Second Samuel, there's a lot that happens, but the narrative feels a lot more cohesive because you're primarily focusing on two people, King Saul and King David. Right? And it's really just one unified story arc that kind of just weaves its way through. By the time you get to kings, though, you're dealing with a whole bunch of kings. Right? You are dealing with two different kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. You're dealing with all these kings with all these different weird names. And it's very easy to just like lose track of what exactly is going on. And we actually talked about this when we went through First Kings. I think that's kind of the author's point to a degree. Right? I think the author is wanting to communicate something by, by just like bombarding you with all this information. I think the author is trying to make you feel overwhelmed to where it feels like you never have a good grasp on what's going on. Which is exactly what you should feel like in this culture because it's just mayhem, right? And so we're going to go back. We're just going to kind of recap things just so that as we go into Second Kings next week, we have a better idea of what exactly is going on. Sound good? Mm -hmm. All right. So um, I'm probably going to end up doing a whole lot of talking today, which usually happens. Uh, but I'm going to be yeah. guiding the discussion a little bit more than normal probably because I'm going to try to kind of keep us going um, because I got a whole, we got a whole lot to cover uh, because Genesis – to First Kings is a lot, right? We just spent six months covering one tiny little five chapter book, and now we are going through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First Kings. That's eleven different books, right? We are so we spent six months covering five chapters. Now we're going to spend about two hours covering eleven books. So uh, I'll, I'll try to keep us on pace, right? Uh, but the good news uh, is that the main thing I want to focus on um, isn't really those first eleven chapters of Genesis. Right? As, like, those are foundational chapters when it comes to the story of the Bible because they tell you about the creation of the world. They talk to you about the sinfulness of man. They talk to you about the flood. They talk to you about how the world was scattered and stuff like that. But for our time today, we don't really need to focus on that. In order to understand First and Second Kings, really where you need to start is you need to start with a guy named Abraham. Right? Because what we're going to see in Second Kings is that we're dealing with a people that are divided. Right? And these people are the people of Israel. And in order to understand their story, you've got to start with good old Father Abraham. Because Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you, so let's go praise the Lord. Right? And if you don't know that song, it's a thing that people always learn in Sunday school. Okay, so Abraham. How does his story start? God calls him away from what he's familiar with. And God tells him to go to a place that he's going to uh, show him. Yeah. So basically we start in Genesis chapter 12, right? Genesis chapter 11 is the Tower of Babel, right? Basically we have this event where everybody's all together uh, and they're kind of rising up in the rebellion against God and God scatters them. And we've got a dilemma in the story because we know that God created man to reflect him and God has this goal of bringing all people back to himself. But now... The only thing that unifies everybody is the rebellion against God. And now they're scattered throughout the world. And the big question is, how is God going to deal with these nations who are rebelling against him? And how is he going to find a way to bring them back to him? Well, and the solution is that he is going to pick one man and produce a special nation from that man. And that nation will be the light of the world, right? To where this nation will be God's example by which he's going to try to draw all the other nations back to himself. And so Genesis chapter 12, God shows up to Abraham and he says this. And Yahweh said to Abram, 
Go forth from your land and from your kin and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. I would argue that if you understand these three verses right here, you can understand pretty much the rest of not only the Old Testament, but this is the Bible in general. Right? So God shows up to Abraham. Uh, his name is Abram here. That's because over the course of the story, he has a name change. We don't need to get into that. But God shows up to Abram, and he says, I want you to leave everything. Right? Notice he starts off very broad, and he gets more specific. Go from your land. Go from your family, your kin. Go from your father's house. Right? He says, I want you to leave everything. No, everything. No, everything. And what I want to do with you is I want you to leave everything, and I want you to go to the land which I will show you. So he's very specific about everything Abraham needs to leave. He's not very specific about what Abraham needs to go do. Just go to the place I'll show you. Leave everything, and we'll figure out the rest. So he's calling Abraham to live by faith. Right? I want you to trust me, leave everything, and go somewhere. But he offers Abraham these amazing promises. He says that he's going to give them a land. And he's going to make a nation from Abram. The name Abram means um, exalted father. Eventually, the name Abraham is going to mean father of a great multitude. Right? So he says, I'm going to take you to this land. And in that land, I'm going to make you into a great nation. I, Yahweh, will bless you. And I'll make your name great. Right? I will make you esteemed highly. People will know who you are. And you, Abraham, shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. The one who curses you, I will curse. The word for curse is there. Um, those are actually two different words in Hebrew. It's, it's probably better translated, the one who dishonors you, I will curse. Or the one who slights you, I will curse. Right? To where he says, if anybody even slightly insults you, they're dead to me. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So there's three people involved in this. Right? There's Yahweh. There's Abraham. And then there's the people who respond to Abraham and who interact with him. Right? If you just kind of follow this trajectory throughout the rest of Scripture, you've got God, you've got the people of Israel, and you've got... Who else do we have? People who respond to them. Well, the, the people who interact... Like anybody who's not an Israelite, Gentiles. what do we call them? Gentiles. Right? So you've got God, you've got the Jews, you've got the Gentiles. And what God communicates here is that no matter what, he is going to bless Abraham. Right? So he is no matter what, he is going to bless Abraham. The people of Israel, the Jewish people, it's going to happen, right? There might be some stumbling blocks along the way and stuff, and there might be, you know, some difficulty. But in the end, his goal is to bless them and make them prosper, right? And he says that they are also, in the end, going to bless him, right? So they are going to, in the end, it's all going to work out. Once again, we're going to see throughout the story, it's not going to be immediate, and there's going to be a lot of difficulty, including all the way into First and Second Kings, but eventually, Israel will fulfill their purpose, and they will exalt God, right? And they will be a blessing to the world, right? And so if you're kind of viewing this as a pyramid, God, Israel, and the Gentiles, well, from God to Israel, it's an idea of mutual blessing, right? God's going to bless Israel. Israel's going to bless God. That is set in stone. And then between Israel and the Gentiles, well, Israel, in the end, is going to bless them. Because ultimately, salvation is going to come through Israel. The big question becomes, how do the Gentiles relate to Israel and to God? And what God communicates here is that the way that God is going to relate to the Gentiles hinges on how the Gentiles respond to Israel. Right? He says, I will bless those who bless you, and the one who dishonors you, I will curse. So how God relates to the Gentiles directly hinges on how they treat Israel. Right? If they warmly receive the children of Abraham and they love them? Well, and in general, God is going to take care of them. However, if they even slightly dishonor Abraham or his seed, well, they're on God's bad side. And if you understand that dynamic, you will understand almost every interaction that happens in Scripture. Right? As you continue reading through the story, whenever a random character shows up and they do something nice for Abraham or one of his descendants, things start going well with them. And there's actually some sort of blessing involved here. But if somebody dishonors Israel, oh, they're done. Even if God is the one who sent them to dishonor them, right? I mean, there's times whenever we get into like first and second Kings 
where God is going to send Assyria to destroy the northern kingdom. However, the northern, I mean, Assyria isn't doing it to honor God, right? God is simply using them to accomplish a goal that he has. Assyria is doing it because they hate Israel. And so what's going to happen to Assyria? They're going to be destroyed, right? And so if you understand this, you will understand the entire story of scripture, right? Because basically Israel is going to be God's chosen people. And how you treat Israel is going to change how God treats you, right? Uh, and this also has, a, it, it ultimately leads into the, uh, like, to Christianity, right? Because for us, like, the crazy thing is that Israel ultimately rejects Israel, right? Jesus is the embodiment of who Israel is, right? He is the Messiah. He is the seed of Abraham, the seed of David, yet Israel rejects him. And so for a time period, God is going to reject Israel, but he is ultimately going to bless them, and so he will bring them back. But for those Gentiles who do receive Israel, well, God gives them the greatest blessing of all. He actually welcomes them into the family, right? And so if you understand this dynamic right here, you'll understand basically everything that happens through the rest of the Old Testament, right? Because basically every time a key, like a leader in the house of Israel interacts with somebody, you're always wanting to figure out how are they going to, like, you know, you're trying to figure out how do they relate to Israel, and how is God going to relate to them, right? And so Abraham, he gets up and he goes and he ultimately does do this. And God makes all these promises to Abraham. And as you're reading the story, you can't help but wonder, why is God doing all this, right? And I've already kind of given you a hint of that answer already because ultimately he's going to use Abram to be a light to the nations. But it's not clearly stated in scripture at that point, right? Whenever you read Genesis chapter 12, God just kind of shows up out of nowhere and says, Abraham, get up and go to this land and I'm going to do all this stuff for you. And you can't help but wonder why, right? Why is God doing this, right? Like what is his end goal here? It seems kind of random because for the first 11 chapters of Genesis, God is dealing with things on a very cosmic level, right? He is dealing with all the nations of the earth. He is dealing with creating nations, creating the world, all this stuff. And then all of a sudden he like cares a whole lot about this super old dude who lived in like Mesopotamia. Why? Well, when you get to Genesis 18, we actually get a hint at this. And I would actually argue that this is probably the most explicit explanation that we get of why God chose Abraham at all. He says this, Shall I conceal from Abraham what I am about to do? Since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So you see right here, this is the language calling back to Genesis chapter 12. Right? Jesus, or God is saying, well, if I have made all these promises to Abraham, shouldn't he get special insight to what I'm going to do? He's talking about Sodom and Gomorrah uh, in the context of the story. For I have known him so that he may command his children and his household after him, that they may keep the way of Yahweh to do righteousness and justice so that Yahweh may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. So we see exactly what Abraham and his seed are charged with. What is their job? Their job is to be guardians or keepers or protectors of the way of Yahweh. Um, the, the word for keep right there could be translated as keep, guard, protect. Uh, it's the same word that you see in Hebrew, like whenever Adam and Eve are kicked out of the Garden of Eden and God places a cherubim with a sword um, to guard the entrance. Same word, right? Uh, they're supposed to be guardians of the way. Pretty cool title, right? Uh, they're the guardians of the way of Yahweh. And part of you wonders, what exactly does that mean? What does it mean to guard the way of Yahweh? Uh, you kind of get the, you know, the imagery makes sense, right? If there is a path that leads to Yahweh, they're the ones who guard that path. How do they do that? Well, according to him, it's by doing righteousness and justice, right? Uh, in Hebrew, it's mishpat, that's justice, and righteousness is tzedakah, right? Is these two words, uh, basically, long story short, what they're called to do is they are called to uphold God's standard of good and evil, right? That's what justice is. And they are called to implement that standard of good and evil in their own lives. That is what righteousness is, right? Uh, if you go back once again to the Garden of Eden, remember the tree that they weren't supposed to eat from? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? By choosing to eat from this tree, you are telling God, I don't care about your standard of good and evil. I know good and evil for myself. And that's what we do when we sin, right? Every time we sin, we are telling God, I know better than you, and I'm not listening to you. Well, the whole purpose of the people of Israel is that they are called to submit to God's standard, right? God is the author of justice. He is the author of righteousness. Their job is to guard that path and to make it clear that justice belongs to God. 
Righteousness belongs to God. They uphold God's standard and they live their life God's way. They are supposed to be the image bearers of God who are living as a light to the nations. And this is actually really cool whenever you keep reading once again into the New Testament. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then whenever you actually get to the early church, before they were called Christians, do you know what they were called? Followers of the way. Followers of the way. Right? If you go back to this language right here, they're making a pretty big claim. They are saying that all the other Jewish sects have strayed from the way, but the Christians, they are the ones who are following the way. Because by following Jesus, you are following the one person who can actually make you righteous because he is the one person who has actually accomplished justice through his sacrifice on the cross. Right? Uh, and, and so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to highlight not only how this story paves the way for kings, but ultimately how it's going to pave the way all the way to the cross. Right? Uh, and so this is what they're called to do. Right? They are called to live by faith in Yahweh. They are called to follow him. They are called to submit to him. Uh, and that's really what the story of Genesis is about, right? It's teaching us what it looks like to live by faith, right? So you see Abraham, you see Isaac, you see Jacob, you see Joseph, you see Judah. You see all these stories about these men who live by faith, but their faith is a very different type of faith than what we're used to because these guys, God shows up to them all the time, right? I mean, I'm not saying like every day, but these guys are interacting with God and they are just literally living from one moment to the next. They, they have no law. Right? They have not received the Torah that the Israelites are going to have or anything like that. They are simply living by faith in God. And whenever he tells them to go do something, they go and do it. Or, in some cases, they just don't do it. And that's part of the lesson. Right? <laughs> They're learning to live by faith. But by the time you get to the end of the book of Genesis, the people of Israel, the seed of Abraham, they are not living in the land that God promised them. And they have not become the great nation that God said they would be. And it doesn't seem like they are being a blessing to the nations. If anything, the nations are blessing them because they literally had to move into the land of Egypt just so they could survive. And then we turn the page, and all of a sudden we're in the book of Exodus. And when you get to the book of Exodus, the people of Israel have become enslaved. And during their enslavement, they actually began to prosper. And the more that they were afflicted in Egypt, the more they began to expand, and they finally do become a great and mighty nation. And during this time period, they begin to call out to God. And they say, God, where are you at? When are you going to do the things for us that you said that you would do? When are you going to deliver us into the land that you promised to our ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Joseph? Where are you? And God hears their cry. And ultimately, what God's going to do is he is going to appoint a man named Moses to come and deliver them from the land of Egypt. And this story right here, we call it the Exodus story, because the word Exodus just means to exit. Right? It's the great exit. Um, this is the quintessential story at the heart of the Jewish belief system. Right? This is literally the heartbeat of the Jewish people. Right? As Christians, we often look back at the death and resurrection of Jesus as like the key moment in our faith. Well, for the Jewish people, it was the exodus. Because once again, if you go back to Genesis, whenever God shows up, he's not doing like he, he's, he's a very personal God. Right? He shows up to Abraham, he shows up to Isaac, he shows up to Jacob, and he gives instructions, but he doesn't do anything crazy flashy. Right? Yes, he does cause elderly people to suddenly conceive and give birth, but that's still a very like private matter that not everybody's going to know about. We haven't really seen what makes Yahweh Yahweh. And so the people of Israel, they're devoted to God at this point, but... Really, their faith in him is more their ancestors' faith, right? They are simply trusting that their ancestors knew what was happening. And so this Exodus moment is where God gets to flex for his people, and he gets to show them exactly what he's made of. And so he sends Moses into the land of Egypt, and with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, he delivers them, right? This is where you get to see God at his full power. Keep in mind, at this time period, Egypt is at like the height of its power, Right? This is 18th dynasty Egypt, where literally like the most popular pharaohs you've ever heard of, this is their time period. Right? The pyramids have already been built, but the Egyptians, they are just going crazy with power. Right? They, are the, like, they are the superpower of the earth at this time period. They've got the mightiest army. They've got all this strength, yet they are going to ultimately be subdued without the Israelites even having to raise a hand. Because God himself has raised his hand. And he is going to afflict them with ten miraculous plagues, ultimately culminating in this one plague where every firstborn son 
and Egypt dies. But that moment right there is this feast that's going to be established called the Feast of Passover. The people of Israel, they take a lamb, they slaughter the lamb as a sacrifice, they take the blood of the lamb, they paint it over the doorposts so that whenever the Spirit of God descends through the land, it sees the blood of the lamb covering their household and it passes over them in judgment and it goes everywhere else. So you've got this moment where they are freed from slavery through the death of a sacrificial lamb, right? And everybody who is not covered by that blood of the lamb, they do have to face death. And they actually are the greater slaves of the story, right? Even though Egypt is not enslaved to themselves, we're all slaves to God, and we all must submit to his judgment, right? Either we repent and are covered by a sacrifice and we are freed, or we have to pay the penalty of our sins. And so for the Egyptians, a lot of firstborn sons die. And so ultimately, the people of Israel are freed, and God is going to originally take them, you know, through, like, if you're going from Egypt to the land that God promised Abraham, the straightest path is literally, you know, just a straight line, and you, there's a clear land path that they could have gone through. But God knew that they hadn't learned their lesson quite yet, right? He knew that even though all he'd done all this stuff, he knew that the moment that they got into Philistine territory, they would freak out and run back to Egypt because none of them had fought a battle before. And so God decides, I need to communicate something to these people. And so instead, he has Moses lead them not to the land, but he has Moses lead them to a sea. And then he hardens the heart of Pharaoh so that Pharaoh sends the army chasing after them to try to bring them back to Egypt. So all of a sudden, you've got the Israelites recently freed, caught between the water and an army. No path out. And they're freaking out. And there's like, Moses, what are you doing? Did you get us out of here just to kill us? And Moses turns and says, shut up and listen. Actually, shut up and watch. You need to just sit back and be quiet and let God do his work. And all of a sudden, the wind begins to blow. And over the course of the night, the waters of the sea begin to part. And the people of Israel cross through the sea on dry ground. They get to the other side. Pharaoh's army chases in after them. The waters come crashing down. And the entire army of Pharaoh, well, the army that chased after them, is killed. And Israel is at last freed from bondage. They did not have to raise a single sword. But God fought the battle for them. Right? God just communicated, I don't need a huge army. I don't need you at all. You simply need to live by faith in me and I can take care of you. Right? That is what God is communicating there. And that leads ultimately to what the Israelites sing right here, Exodus 15. Right? They cross the Red Sea in Exodus 14. Exodus 15, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Go read the whole song though. It's really good. Then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to Yahweh. And they said, I will sing to Yahweh for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. Yah is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God and I will praise him. My father's God and I will extol him. Who is like you among the gods, O Yahweh? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, fearsome in praises, working wonders? Yahweh shall reign forever and ever. That moment right there is the moment that Yahweh becomes Israel's God. Right? All of a sudden, they understand. This, like, you know, all the nations have their gods. Right? You know, the Egyptians have their gods. The Canaanites have their gods. The Philistines have their gods. But in this moment, Israel realizes our God isn't just like the other gods. Our God is the God. Like he's the God of gods. He is the one who can subdue all the Egyptian gods. We will praise him forever. Ultimately, we're going to see that um, human faithfulness is very fleeting. And so literally three days later, they start grumbling against God. But the main point is that this moment is transformative. And all of a sudden, the people of Israel, they are bought into this. And so what God does is he has Moses lead them to a mountain called Sinai, right? Uh, also known as Horeb. And at this mountain, God's going to show up. And this is what we read uh, about this whole event. Now Moses went up to God. He goes up on the mountain. And Yahweh called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I lifted you up on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. So now then, if you will indeed listen to my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So in this moment, God communicates to Moses, I'm going to do something special for y'all. 
He says, if you will submit to me, and if you submit to my standard of rule, I will make you unlike any nation you have ever seen. He says, Moses, let me be clear. All the earth is mine. I could pick literally anybody. But if I've chosen you. And so if you submit to me, I will make you a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Right? What is the job of a priest? To be the communication between the people and God. Yeah. A priest is a mediator. Right? He's the one who mediates between God and man. He says, Moses, if y'all submit to me, all of you will be a kingdom of priests. Right? You're, the, the nation will exist to mediate between me and the rest of the world. Right? That will be y'all's function. Right? You are going to be the middleman. So that whenever people want to figure out how to get to me, all they have to do is look at Israel. And if they want to know how I'm communicating to them, all they have to do is look to Israel. He says, that is what I'm going to expect of y'all. And you're going to be a holy nation. What does the word holy mean? Set apart. Set apart. Different. Unique. He says, I'm going to give you a standard of rule and conduct that's just going to make you different. Right? Some of the differences are going to be moral in nature. Some of them are just going to be different for the sake of being different. Right? He's going to tell them to eat certain foods. He's going to tell them to dress certain ways. He's going to tell them to celebrate certain holidays. Some of these things are going to have moral significance. Some of them are not. Some of them are just going to be them submitting to him. So what he's establishing is that he is going to give them a law. The Hebrew word for law is? Torah. Torah. Yes. He's going to give them a Torah, a command, a rule of, a set of instructions. And he begins to give them that Torah in Exodus chapter 20. Right? Exodus chapter 20, God begins to speak from Mount Sinai, and Moses begins to deliver the law to the people. And that really is what Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy is all about. Right? So you actually had some aspects of the law that were taught in Genesis, and then some of them that were taught in the early aspects of Exodus. But whenever you get to the back half of Exodus, all of Leviticus, most of Numbers, and Deuteronomy, that's where you get the heavy law portion. And that's where whenever people start doing the whole read the Bible through a year, like read through the Bible in a year thing, uh, usually whenever you get to the back half of Exodus, that's where people drop off because they find it boring. But for the people of Israel, this is crucial, right? I mean, this is going to be the fabric of their reality. Like every single day they live to apply this law. And that's even true to this day, right? This is what they do. I mean, this is literally where God himself is communicating to them what he wants them to do. And so for us, we start falling asleep and rubbing our eyes and skipping these passages but for them, this is important. Whenever he explains exactly what each sacrifice needs to look like, they better pay attention because those sacrifices are important for them relating to him. And how can they be a kingdom of priests if they themselves cannot contact God? Right? And so these laws are super duper important. And they're going to basically just lay the groundwork for Jewish society. And it's going to be the very thing that makes them different. And this is where I can actually skip some stuff because we don't need to go in depth into all these laws. There are just some things I want to highlight to you. Towards the end of the law, you get to the book of Deuteronomy. The word Deuteronomy, just so you know, uh, it means second law. Deutero means second. Namos means law. So Deuteronomy is the second law. right? Long story short, the people of Israel did not obey God super duper well uh, while they were in the wilderness on the way to the promised land. And so they end up getting um, basically sentenced to wandering 40 years in the wilderness. The generation that was freed from Egypt is going to die in the wilderness and their children are going to go into the promised land, right? Well, the reason why Deuteronomy exists is because things are going to look a little bit different living in the promised land versus living in the wilderness, right? Whenever they're living in the wilderness, God is dwelling in their presence in this thing called the tabernacle, and they're all dwelling in a camp very close together. Once they get into the promised land, however, they're going to be scattered. They're going to be spread out. They're not going to be living beside each other. And so things are going to look a little bit different. That's what Deuteronomy is explaining. Right? It is the second law because it's basically communicating to a second generation how the law is going to function once they get into the land. And towards the end of Deuteronomy, uh, Moses communicates this. Now it will be, if you diligently listen to the voice of Yahweh your God, being careful to do all his commandments, which I am commanding you today, Yahweh your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you listen to the voice of Yahweh your God. Right? And then, in the next few verses, he explains exactly what those blessings will look like. Right? So ultimately, what Moses communicates is that if they submit to the law, and if they listen to God's voice, and they actually apply his words, things are going to go well with them in the land. Right? A lot of times, people will misunderstand 
Um, like, whenever New Testament Christians go back and read the Old Testament, they will think that in some way the law was essential to salvation. The reason why they think that is because usually uh, in our churches, uh, we have a very difficult time thinking outside of terms of salvation because in many ways we become very self-serving. And to us, the only reason we would ever obey God is if we got eternal life out of it. That's not what this is about, right? It's not about eternal life at all, right? Salvation has always been by grace through faith. And we see that throughout Scripture. This isn't about eternal life. It is simply about how they're going to live, right? If they submit, things will go well for them in the land, and they will dwell in peace. However, it will be, if you do not listen to the voice of Yahweh your God, to keep and to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I am commanding you today, these curses will come upon you and overtake you. And let's just say that the curses that he lists out are basically three times as long as the blessings that he shares. And that's because God is trying to motivate them to not disobey. He says, guys, if you disobey me and you don't follow the law, I'm going to do a lot of things to you and they're not going to be pleasant, right? You are going to be very frustrated by how things go because there's, no, there's going to be no peace in the land. You're going to be afflicted. You're going to be tortured. You're going to be enslaved. You're going to be exiled. You're going to die. So just listen to me. And the reason why God is doing this is because once again, Israel exists to guard the way of Yahweh. And so he's got to be harsher with them than he is with others, right? Because if he wants them to be an example of how to relate to him, and if their purpose is to show off his justice and his righteousness, well, if they don't demonstrate his justice and righteousness well, and he tolerates that, well, that sends a bad message to the rest of the world because that communicates to them that God doesn't care about sin. And so rather than destroying the entire world again, like with the flood, he says, no, Israel, with great power comes great responsibility. If I'm going to give you access to me, then I'm going to hold you to a higher standard. And I'm going to expect you to live by this. And if you don't live by it, well, then I'm going to use you as an example for the rest of the world, right? And if you don't listen, well, then you're going to be afflicted. And when people look at you and they see how sorely you're afflicted, well, they're going to say, wow, <laughs> their God must be a righteous God. Um, either that or their God has abandoned them, right? He either, so either he's a very righteous God who is disciplining them or he's a very righteous God who wants nothing to do with them. Either way. However, if they are living righteously and upholding a standard and things go well with them, then people will look and say, wow, their God provides for them. He must be a righteous God. And so either way, God is going to get the glory. It's just a matter of whether or not Israel gets to enjoy him getting the glory, right? They could either follow him and live at peace with him and enjoy the benefits, or they could sin against him, be punished, and he gets the glory, but they get to suffer along the way. So basically, it's like we can do this the easy way or the hard way. That's what God communicates to them through the law. And if you understand that, you can also understand, once again, the rest of the Old Testament. Anytime Israel loses a battle... That tells you something not only about the... like. Oh, here, let me reword that. Whether or not Israel loses a battle never depends on the size of the army. It never does, right? It depends everything on what their relationship with God is looking like at that point, right? So they can have the biggest army in the world. That does not matter. It, it does not affect whether or not they're going to win the army, the battle, right? They can have the smallest army in the world. That says nothing. If you see Israel lose a battle, that implies that they are not in fellowship with God at that moment, right? And so if you understand, like, Deuteronomy 28, that's another crucial chapter to understand because it'll, it'll just inform you about the rest of the Old Testament, right? Whenever all of a sudden uh, King Saul shows up and he's just losing battle after battle. Hmm, something's going on here. Why are the Philistines taking over the land? It's almost like this king isn't good. Whenever David shows up and all of a sudden all the enemies are being subdued, it's almost like David's a good king, Right? Uh, and so if you understand Deuteronomy 28, again, it will help you understand the rest of it. Uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, um, Moses also gives the people of Israel a warning. Uh, and I highlight this mainly because it's going to be relevant to our discussion of kings. Right? Moses is preparing the people to enter into the promised land. And he has made it clear to them that they're not supposed to establish a king over themselves. Right? Because God is their king. Remember going back to Exodus 15? They said, Yahweh will reign forever and ever. Right? Yahweh is their king. He is their lawgiver. They're not supposed to have a king. But Moses also knows them. And he knows that the devotion that they speak is usually a lot stronger than the devotion they actually practice. And so he says this. When you enter the land which Yahweh your God gives you, 
and you possess it and live in it, and you say, I will set a king over me like the nations who are around me, you shall surely set a king over you whom Yahweh your God chooses. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over yourselves. You may not put a foreigner over yourselves who is not your brother. So he says, okay, guys, inevitably, whenever you get into the land, you're going to want to be like the nations. I know that your one job is to be different and set apart and holy, but you're not going to want to do it. You're going to want to be like the nations because there's this natural human desire to conform. He says, you're going to want to be like the nations. You're going to ask for a king. And you know what? God's going to be gracious and he's going to give you a king. But here's the rules. If you're going to appoint a king, God has to be the one to choose him. You don't get to choose him. And furthermore, he's got to be from the people of Israel, which seems to imply that he understands that they're also not going to rely on God to choose him. Right? Because if God is the one choosing, well, then ultimately God's going to choose somebody from Israel. But it seems like Moses is aware that they're still like, they're going to violate that too. Right? You're going to start appointing your own kings. And if you choose to not listen to God, at the very least, pick somebody from Israel. Right? Uh, And so Moses doesn't seem to have much faith in these people because he's been leading them for 40 years. He knows that they're rebellious. Moreover, he shall not multiply horses for himself. Nor shall he cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. Yahweh has said to you, you shall never again return that way. And he shall not multiply wives for himself, or else his heart will turn away. Nor shall he greatly increase silver and gold for himself. Alright, so there's three prohibitions given to kings. Don't multiply horses. Don't multiply women. And don't multiply wealth. Right? Uh, Really, you could say three W's. Warfare, women, wealth. Uh, And the reason why, uh, it doesn't really explain it here, but you just kind of just keep reading and you kind of just see how God responds to this stuff. It seems like the reason God doesn't want them to multiply horses is because he doesn't want them to become reliant on their armies, right? Because ultimately, uh, the only reason you need a bunch of horses is because you're trying to, you know, puff up your armies and make it as big as possible. God doesn't want that, right? Because God, like, the the bigger your army is, the more children have to die, right? That's what you're doing, right? Uh, Because ultimately, you are taking children who could be at home and you're throwing them into a battlefield, Right? And God is communicating, I don't need a big army. I just need an army who is faithful. And so the, mo- the moment that a king begins multiplying horses, it lets you know that he is relying more on the army than he has on God. So he says, I don't want you multiplying horses. Also, I don't want you multiplying women. Uh, there's several reasons for this. First off, polygamy is bad. Um, but that's not even really the main emphasis here. right? Because in that culture, people just did it. Right? You're supposed to be set apart. You're supposed to be different. Right? Other kings, they might multiply women, usually because of political alliances and stuff like that. But he says, you don't need political alliances. Because in political alliances, what are you doing? You're relying more on your alliances than you are on me. Right? I don't want you to do that. I want you to rely on me. Right? And that's what we're going to see, is that ultimately these women, uh, they are going to either be uh, for political alliances, or even if they're just out of lust, um, they're going to lead the king astray. Right? Because ultimately, they are going to cause the king to rely on foreign nations more than God, or they're going to lead the king to worshiping other gods. Right? You can't marry somebody and expect them to not have some sort of influence on you. And all these women, I mean, you're not just marrying only local women. Right? Kings, they always want to marry the exotic. Right? So they're going to marry foreign women who worship other gods. And he doesn't want his king to be led astray. And then thirdly, he shall not increase silver or gold for himself. Why? Well, because usually, um, whenever a king is multiplying silver and gold for himself, where is that silver and gold coming from? Whenever rulers start getting rich, who suffers? They're getting it from their own people. Usually from their own people, right? It's usually from taxation. It's usually from enslavement. And so he says, the king's goal is not to become rich. The king's goal is to serve. And so the moment that a king begins multiplying gold and silver... That's the moment that you know that that king, he's no longer serving the people, he's serving himself, right? There's nothing inherently wrong with having money, but if you're in a position like this and you're suddenly getting rich, maybe you're exploiting the job. And so God says, a king shall not do those things. Remind, just remember that, okay? Keep that in the back of your mind. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Moses also communicates at the end of Deuteronomy that he knows exactly how this story is going to go, right? He knows that in the end, Israel is going to turn from God. But he also continues to go on and express that Israel will ultimately come back to God. But it's not going to be an easy journey. Um, Y'all know how much I love Deuteronomy 32. We could go a lot more in depth in it. But for now, let me just read part of it. Um, Jeshurun, just so you know, that's a title that Moses uses to refer to Israel as a whole. 
uh, he's basically prophesying what's going to happen in the future. And he basically says that God is going to take them into the land. He's going to establish them in the land. He's going to give them all the things he promised. And then we read this. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, thick, and sleek. Then he abandoned God who made him and treated the rock of his salvation with wicked foolishness. They made him jealous with strange gods. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons who were not God, to gods whom they have not known, new gods who came lately, whom your fathers did not dread. You neglected the rock who begot you. You forgot the God who brought you forth. So Moses predicts that once Israel gets into the land, they are going to prosper. But rather than prospering under the mighty hand of God and giving glory to God, they're going to be like a spoiled brat, a, uh, an entitled child. Um, they're going to get fat and, and self-indulgent. And rather than thanking God for all that he's given, they're going to say, we don't need you anymore. And they're going to rebel against God. And they're going to start worshiping other gods. And they're going to abandon the law. And they're going to just turn towards their own wicked ways, which is kind of what humans do. right? And this is true even to this day. right? Whenever we are in a state of prosperity and luxury and privilege, typically we don't focus on God that much. Usually the people who are crying out to God are the ones who literally are, you know, they're going through a divorce. Right? They're the ones who, they just lost their job. And they say, God, I don't know where to go. I'm going to you. Right? Usually, um, the human heart is so focused on serving the self that we only turn to God the moment we have no one else to turn to. Right? And so God says that's what Israel is going to do as well. Israel is going to turn from God. And at the height of their prosperity, they're going to crumble. And they're going to rebel. And if you keep reading Deuteronomy 32, God ultimately says what he's going to do to them as a result. He says, okay. If you turn from me, then I will turn from you. He says he's going to do three things. Step one, he is going to hide his face from them. Right? He's going to conceal himself. Right? He is going to withdraw. Right? So at this point, he is dwelling with them in the tabernacle. Eventually, he's going to dwell with them in the temple. But if they continue to rebel, he's going to withdraw from them. He'll leave the temple. He'll leave them radio silent. Right? He will silence the mouths of the prophets. He'll begin to teach in parables. Right? He will hide his teachings from them. That's judgment number one. Secondly, he will take himself to the Gentiles. He says, you have made me jealous with what is not a God. I will make you jealous with what is not a people. Right? If you're going to go worship things that aren't even gods, well, then I'll just go take myself to the, all, all the other nations. And so God will begin to show his mercy, not to the people of Israel, but to the Gentiles. And then thirdly, uh, and this is the final act of judgment he will do to them, he will basically let them be destroyed to the point of near annihilation, right? He will send the Gentiles against them to afflict them and nearly total, just like destroy them. But then at the moment when they need him the most, at the moment when hope seems totally lost, they will cry out to him. He will intervene and he will save them, right? That is what Moses communicates in Deuteronomy 32. And that sets the trajectory once again for the rest of scripture. Right? And we're going to see this cycle again and again and again. Right? Israel will prosper, they'll rebel, and God will conceal himself, go to the Gentiles, and afflict them. Conceal himself, go to the Gentiles, and afflict them. Uh, we already saw that in 1 Kings. We're going to see it again in 2 Kings, and we're even going to see it in the Gospels whenever we get there. Right? Uh, and so that's what happens there. Uh, Moses does eventually die. Uh, he dies the very year that they go into the Promised Land. And this was judgment from God because Moses, um, he also was not a perfect person. And he ends up not getting to go into the promised land either. Right? So he dies with that generation. Um, his successor, his right-hand man, his little protege, Joshua, he is the one who leads the people into the promised land. They conquer the land mostly. Uh, and they dedicate themselves to God. Right? They, they say, we are not going to do what our ancestors did. We are going to worship God. We are going to be devoted to him. Shortly before Joshua dies, he stands before the people and he says, choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the entire congregation of Israel, before they disperse to their tribes, they cry out and they say, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. And if this were a movie, this is where the book of Joshua would cut to black. And the story ends on a very vibrant and exciting note. And then that's when Morgan Freeman's voice comes over the narration and says, and they did not. They did not. <laughs> because whenever you flip to the book of Judges, you see that the people of Israel are doing exactly what Moses warned. Right? Moses said, 
that in their prosperity they would rebel, and that's exactly what happens. Right? The people are now dwelling in their different tribal allotments. Right? They are scattered throughout the land. And in this time period, they begin to slowly but surely turn against God. And this is where we actually began our study. Right? Years ago, for those of y'all who were with us, we started with Judges. Uh, and the reason why we started with Judges was actually uh, my personal conviction that that's what the church needs to hear. Uh, because the book of Judges, uh, it is basically a book that details the slow and gradual moral decay of the people of God. Right? Because it just starts with them not taking God's word as seriously. But as you keep reading, just one chapter after the next, it gets so bad that by the end of the chapter, the people of Israel are doing things so unthinkable that even Sodom and Gomorrah didn't accomplish those things. Right? And the reason we started going through Judges is because I was saying, I'm afraid that that's where our, church is con- like, our churches are kind of heading a little bit. Uh, because in general, we don't study the word of God enough. Right? And even when we do study the Word of God, we study it out of context, and we don't take it seriously. And the only things we quote are these pithy verses that we just take out of context and just turn it into whatever we want it to say. And we can't expect that we are going to genuinely walk in obedience to God if we don't treat His Word highly and with respect. And so, to me, I study, like, I led us through Judges just as, like, a warning to us. Right? I want, like, even if the rest of the church falls away, I don't want us to, right? I want us to be part of the solution. Uh, and I'm not saying that every church is falling away. I'm just saying that in general, um, there is that natural tendency within the people of God to do this, right? And so we went through the book of Judges, uh, and what we see is that basically there's this cycle, right? The people of Israel dwelling in the land will turn away from God, and they will begin to worship foreign gods, idols, right? They will bow down to them, and as a result, God will enslave them, right? He will send a foreign enemy Right? The Moabites, the Midianites, the Ammonites, the Philistines. He will send them in to oppress the people for a time uh, until the people of Israel cry out to God. And whenever they cry out to God, God will be faithful. He will hear them. He will answer them. And he will send somebody to deliver them. Uh, this deliverer is called a judge. Right? And whenever you think of judge, I don't want you to think of a person with a white wig and a gavel. Uh, <laughs> even though they did do judicial things at times. Um, I want you to think more like the heroes of Greek mythology. Right? That's what these guys are. These are mighty people who do these amazing acts of valor. And they basically single-handedly deliver the people of Israel from oppression. Um, it, it's actually really cool stories. And so whenever you read through Judges, there's a bunch of them. Right? There's Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah, Gideon, and Abimelech. Abimelech, he's not really necessarily a judge. He's actually the son of Gideon. And I would actually say that his story is just kind of like a an addendum to Gideon's story. Uh, then there's Tola, Jer, Jephthah, Ibzah, Elam, Abdon, and Samson. And the main thing you need to know about these judges is that they accomplished great feats, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they were any better than the culture around them. Um, people like Othniel and Shamgar, they seem like really good guys, right? They are faithful. But as you read through the book of Judges, you begin to see that God is simply working with whatever he's got, right? By the time you get to Samson, I mean, Samson is terrible. He's a bad dude. And it's just like literally the only way that God accomplishes anything good through Samson is by using Samson's evil and twisting it for good. Right? Samson is this lustful, hot-headed man-child. Yet God uses that anger and that lust to basically destroy the Philistines from the inside. So Samson is not really that faithful to God, but God can still use him. Right? And so that's one thing that we learned through Judges, is that God doesn't even need his people to be faithful to accomplish his word. But he would prefer them to be faithful, because it goes easier for them if they are. Right? And then you know, they're working in harmony with one another, not against one another. And so uh, you get through the book of Judges, uh, and by the time you get to the end of the story, things are looking really, really bad. Right? I mean, like, Israel is just corrupt, uh, and you read this one phrase again and again. There was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And it's kind of heartbreaking because you realize, like, that's almost like the message of Judges. You realize that this is not going to work unless Israel has a king, which is sad because God was supposed to be their king, but apparently people just aren't good at worshiping what they can't see. And so the author of Judges himself is like, I don't know, maybe they need one. Right? Like, they weren't supposed to have a king, but maybe that is what they need. And that sets up what we get in the book of Samuel, right? Um, Samuel is going to be the final judge of Israel. And Samuel is actually a really decent dude, right? Samuel, 
Uh, he shows up in the time period of the judges, uh, and he is raised up um, like in a really cool story. We don't need to get into the story right now. But long story short, whenever Samuel serves as judge of Israel, he leads a massive revival. Right? The people of Israel are corrupt at that time period, but man, he single-handedly leaves them, like leads them back to God. And one of my favorite phrases about Samuel, I actually quoted it whenever I was praying earlier, um, it says that not a single word of Samuel's fell to the ground. Right? Whenever, pe- whenever Samuel spoke, people listened. And they didn't simply hear his words. Like his words were planted in their hearts and they were changed by his words. And to me, that is my prayer for us, right? That's what I want us to be. I want us to be people who speak and our words actually transform people, right? Um, not because our words are significant, but because our words are the words of God, right? And that's what Sam, like Samuel was. Really cool guy. But every time things start going good for the people of Israel, they rebel. And so we read this um, near the end of Samuel's life. Well, not near the end of Samuel's life, uh, but at the height of Samuel's rule. Uh, as judge. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together, and they came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, Behold, you have grown old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations. <sighs> That's exactly what Moses said they were going to ask for. Mm-hmm. But the thing was evil in the sight of Samuel. When they said, Give us a king to judge us, why is it evil in his sight? Because they weren't supposed to have a king. Right? Samuel hears this and he's like, guys, you're kidding me. And Samuel prayed to Yahweh. Then Yahweh said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. So God speaks and he says, Samuel, don't take this personally. They haven't rejected you. You've been a good leader. And they like you as a leader. Who they've really rejected is me. Because that's all they ever do. But God is a gentleman, right? He's not going to force himself upon people, right? If they don't want to have, if they don't want anything to do with him, he's not going to make them. And so he says, okay, if they want to be like the nations, even though they agreed to not be like the nations, if they want to be like the nations, let's let them do it. If they want a king, let's give them a king. And you know what? We'll give them a king just like the nations. However, Samuel's going to give them a warning ahead of time. And so, a few verses later, Samuel gathers the people together, and he's going to tell them what they can expect from this king. So Samuel spoke all the words of Yahweh to the people who had asked him of him a king. And he said, this will be the custom of the king who will reign over you. This will be the custom, right? This is what you can expect of a worldly king. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself in his chariots and among his horsemen, and they will run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and of fifties, and some to do his plowing and to reap his harvest and to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. Right? So he's going to take your kids, who should be at home with you, he's going to send them off to war to die in a battlefield. Battles that you don't even care about. He's going to take your free men, your other sons and daughters, he's going to enslave them. Not to do any meaningful work, no, just to plow his fields. He will also take your daughters for perfumers and cooks and bakers. Not perfumers and cooks and bakers for the people, but for his own palace to serve himself. He will take the best of your fields and your vineyards and your olive groves and give them to his servants. He'll tax you, right? He'll take all the stuff that belong to you and he'll just give it to his buddies, to his friends, the ones he thinks deserve that better than you. He will take a tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. Expect heavy taxation. He will also take your male slaves and your female slaves and your best young men and your donkeys and use them for his work. So if you're a farmer and you've got a lot of slaves, well, good luck. Because he's going to take your slaves and make them his own. And you won't have any money to buy them back. He'll have all the money and all the slaves. You'll be destitute. You'll be poor. You'll lose your land. You'll be forced to sell it to him. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. Say goodbye to your freedom. Then you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, but Yahweh will not answer you in that day. So Samuel warns him. He says, guys, be careful what you ask for. If you want a king like the nations, well, then you took God for granted because God was your king and he is not like the nations. He is holy, right? He says, look at the Torah. Look at the law God gave you. Look at the land he gave you. 
Look at the laws that he gave about slaves, how he treated them with kindness and love. Look at the laws he wrote about women. Look at how he didn't want you to multiply your armies. God is a holy king. He doesn't do things the way that normal kings do. God's kingdom is an upside down kingdom where the meek are the ones who are blessed, where the poor in spirit are the ones who are blessed, where the persecuted are the ones who are blessed. If you want a king like the nations, then your nation will be like all the other nations. And your kingdom will be one that is corrupt, power hungry, and it benefits the people in charge. This right here actually teaches us a little bit about just human politics in general. Yes. Because this is not just true about Israel. This is true about any human government ever. Right? Um, that, that's the thing, like, for me, I just don't place a lot of faith in government. Because any time a politician stands and, like, you know, they, you know, they, they tell, like, you know, they have a little ad telling you exactly what they're going to do for you, they might want to do those things, but I can guarantee you that they're not actually wanting to do them for you. Right? Politicians in general, there's corruption, right? I mean, think about it. How often, like, I mean, I'm not a politician, but how often do I actually just stop and do things for other people just because it's the right thing? Usually we have ulterior motives. And politicians, well, they have the constant temptation of power that is luring them in, right? You know, people say power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. The only person that doesn't apply to is God. And so Samuel tells them, if you want a king like the nations, good luck. Because this guy is going to take, 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 take. You want a king who's going to give, give, give? Well, you're living in a fantasy world. The only king who does that is God, and you just rejected him. And so if you want a king like the nations, be ready to deal with tyrants. And you're going to cry out to God, and he's going to say, tough luck. Because this is what you asked for. He's not going to force himself upon you. He's going to give you exactly what you wanted. This sets up the reigns of Saul, David, and Solomon, which are going to be the time period which we know as the United Monarchy, uh, which is going to lead us through 1st and 2nd Samuel and ultimately into the first 11 chapters of 1st Kings. All right. Um, I've started attaching dates here because by the time we get to this time period is whenever we can actually speak with more confidence on exactly the dates of these figures. Because they're historical figures, right? We're not dealing with fairy tales. We're dealing with real historical people. Um, Saul is the one person where we're not totally sure about the dates. And that's because whenever you read the scriptures, if you remember back in 1 Samuel, um, there was like some, um, th there's some difficulty with the Hebrew there uh, where we don't know exactly what it's trying to say whenever it says how long Saul reigned. Um, but by and large, it seems to suggest that he reigned 40 years, right? Uh, and then David and Solomon also reigned for 40 years also, uh, which is just interesting, right? The first three kings of Israel seem to have all reigned for 40 years. But each of these kings are very different from one another. So let's take some time to talk about each of them individually. First up is Saul. Uh, and this is where um, God gave them exactly what they wanted, right? They asked for a king like the nations, and Saul is that picture-perfect king like the nations. He's tall, he's dark, he's handsome. You know, this is what politicians are usually like. I don't know what's going on with politicians nowadays. Uh, but if you go back a few decades, um, who, who was it the, um, who was it who Nixon had run against? Like where, uh, was it JFK, I think? Yeah. Well, no, no, I'm, I'm, talking, I'm talking about like, back like, like, like decades ago. I, I think it was JFK. Where like they'd, they'd had a debate, right? Um, during the presidential debates, whenever they were running, uh, and uh, this is when television first got started. Right? Yes, it was the first televised debate. And, you know, some people listened on radio, and some people listened or watched it on TV. And that made all the difference in the world. Because the people who listened on radio, I believe they thought it was, um, who was he running against? It was JFK. I forget who he was running against. Was it Richard Nixon? Uh, maybe. I don't know. Uh, but the people who were listening, they thought that JFK's opponent won. But the people who watched the TV, they all said, well, no, JFK clearly won. And that's because whenever you look at JFK, he was just this good-looking dude, right? Uh, and that, that influences people, right? I mean, think about, like, politicians nowadays, right? You don't even have to agree with a politician. But if they're a good-looking person who's well put together and they're very good at public speaking, oh, yeah, you, like, you, it's kind of hard to not start rooting for them a little bit, right? Especially if they're next to somebody who's, like, all, like, crusty and old and like grumpy. you know like you naturally want to root for the good looking person well that's who Saul is right tall dark and handsome he's the picture perfect king but he doesn't have a godly bone in his body and whenever he does try to act godly it's just for show and so Saul is exactly what the people asked for they wanted a king like the nations Saul was a tyrant he was good at leading them into battle but the way he leads them into battle is by threatening them 
right? He says, hey, you give me your sons to fight in my army or else I will cut up all your animals and make you all super poor. All right, well, <laughs> cool. So he leads them into battle and they win battles, but at what cost, right? They are now living under the tyranny of this king. And so very early on in Saul's reign, uh, Samuel has to confront him and he says, dude, this is not working out, right? You are not being a godly king. Right? And all because God gave the people of Israel what they asked for doesn't mean that you can go do whatever you want to do. Right? And so he says this. You have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of Yahweh your God, which he commanded you. For now Yahweh would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. He says, Saul, you had so much potential. But now your kingdom shall not endure. Yahweh has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. And Yahweh has appointed him as ruler over his people because you have not kept what Yahweh commanded you. So Samuel confronts him and says, Saul, you could have been great, but you didn't focus on God. And he says, yes, God gave them what they wanted. But the thing is, God is going to give them what they need because God has his word to fulfill. And if they want to reject him, he will allow them to do that. But in the end, he has promised he will bless Israel. And so he's not going to let them rebel against him forever. And so if you choose to be a godless king, well, then God will replace you with a godly king. And God will take this vile request they've asked, and he'll redeem it for good. And if there's going to be a king sitting on the throne of Israel, well, God's going to produce a king that's chasing after his heart, not the heart of the other nations. And then this happens again, right? You would think that Saul learns his lesson, but he doesn't. He fails yet again. And so this is the final confrontation between Samuel and Saul. So Samuel said to him, Yahweh has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to your neighbor, who is better than you. Also, the eternal one of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that she should have regret. He says, Saul, God's not going to feel bad about this. He says, maybe the first time God felt a little bit bad, but not anymore, right? You have not repented, right? He has given you chance after chance. You have chosen to be a tyrant. You have chosen to be vile. And so God rejects you, and he's not going to feel bad about rejecting you, and he's going to delight in replacing you. Well, this sets up our boy, David. Whenever we meet David, he's not your picture-perfect king, right? He's a good-looking kid, but that's all he is. He's a kid, right? He's a shepherd. He's the youngest of eight sons, forgotten by his family, just dwelling out in the shepherd's fields, playing his music. Yet he's picked by God to be the most important person in the world, to be God's king of God's holy nation. It's an amazing story, right? And this is the story that you read from 1 Samuel 16 all the way through the end of 2 Samuel. You get to see David rise up through the ranks of Israel. He fights Goliath. He rises through Saul's army. He, he earns the affections of everybody. Everybody just loves him to the point that Saul gets jealous and David has to go on the run. And David is a fugitive on the run for a long time until Saul ultimately dies. And then the people come to David and they say, we love you so much, we're going to make you king. And David doesn't even have to put himself on the throne, right? God does it despite all the setbacks that David faces. And so David ultimately does get put on the throne. And it's just a really cool story because throughout the whole story, what we see is that David is different, right? He is the people's people, right? He's not tall, dark, and handsome, but everybody who meets David loves him. And that's because they realize that David's got something that they don't, right? He's got this undying devotion to God. And he does weird things, right? I mean, whenever everybody is trembling before a giant, David says, just give me a stone and a sling and I'll go out there without any armor, right? Because this guy, he's insulting God and that doesn't sit right with me. Or he'll literally, you know, go dancing through the streets of Jerusalem nearly butt naked just because he's praising God. And he's like, I don't care what y'all think about me. I don't need to be a royal, regal king. No, I don't care. I'll be more undignified than this. I'm going to praise God. And so David's a weird guy. But everybody can't help but be attracted to him. Because he's, he's chasing after God's heart. right? He's a godly king. And people love him. And ultimately, God makes this promise to David. Because David, uh, long story short, um, once he becomes king, he decides that he's going to move the capital of Israel. Um, he wants to unify the nation, and so he picks a city in the center of the land, a city called Jerusalem. And he conquers the city. He makes it the capital. 
right? Before the city was called Jebus because it was it was inhabited by the Jebusites. David conquers it. He calls it Jerusalem, the city of peace. He makes it the capital. He makes his palace there. He moves the tabernacle there. But one day, David is strolling around. And from his palace, he looks down on the tent right next door where the Ark of the Covenant is. And he says, you know, this seems kind of unfair. God is the one who established this nation. And he's the one who established me. He took me from the shepherd's fields and he gave me this palace. Yet he's dwelling in a tent. That doesn't seem right. Shouldn't God be in a palace bigger than my own? And so he calls forward and he basically says to one of the prophets, a guy named Nathan, he says, hey, I'd like to build a temple for God. I want to build a house for him so that he can be in a house like me because he's built a house for me. The least I can do is build a house for him. And Nathan at first says, go and do what seems right in your heart because that's a really cool request, right? Most people, if they were in David's shoes, they wouldn't be thinking about doing something for God. They would be like the rest of Israel, right? They would grow fat and kick, right? They would turn away from God. But David's different. And so Nathan says, go and do it. But then God shows up and says, hey, Nathan, um, I like David's request, but I actually have something different planned there. I want his son to build me a temple. For David, though, I want you to give him a message. And this is what Nathan says to David. This is Yahweh speaking to Nathan. So now thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says Yahweh of hosts, I myself took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make you a great name. Hey, what does that sound like? I'll make you a great name? The promise to Abraham. Mm. It sounds like the promise to Abraham. It's almost like God's making another covenant. Like the name of the great men who are on the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them that they may dwell in their own place and not be disturbed again. And the unrighteous will not afflict them any more as formerly even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Yahweh also declares to you that Yahweh will make a house for you. And at this point, you might say, what do you mean? I thought he already made a house for David, right? This whole story started with David saying that God's made a house for him. But he's talking about a different house. He's not talking about a physical house. He's talking about an ancestral house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up one of your seed after you who will come forth from your own body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will reprove him with the rod of men and the strikes from the sons of men. But my hesed, my loving kindness, shall not be removed from him as I removed it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever, and your throne shall be established forever. This is what we call the Davidic covenant. Right? God shows up and he says, David, because of your heart for me, I'm going to do for you what I didn't do for Saul. And I'm going to make your kingdom one that's not going to end. Right? You're going to have a kid. And your kid's going to have a kid. And your kid's kid's going to have a kid. And they're going to be kings. And I'm going to make your throne last. And here's what I promised you, David. Whenever you have these kids, I'm going to be as a father to them and they will be as a son, of, son to me. The sons of David will rightfully be called the sons of God, right? Because of how I will take care of them. And whenever they sin, I will discipline them. And whenever they obey, I'll reward them. What we get to see is that God is almost going to treat the kings of Israel like a smaller version of Israel itself. Right? So just how Israel, you know, they had the blessings and curses with the Torah. Well, since Israel kind of rejected God and made the king, like, so it's really kind of funny. Like, the story of the Old Testament is the story of the people rejecting God, right? And so the world rejected God. So God said, I'm going to pick one nation from the world to be mine. But then that nation rejected him. And so he says, okay, well, I'm going to pick one, one man from that nation to, to be mine. <laughs> and so that's kind of what's happening here, right? So the king is to the people of Israel what the people of Israel are to the world, right? And if the king is being obedient, well, then the people of Israel will be blessed. If the king is being disobedient, then the people of Israel will be cursed. And that's usually because people follow their leaders, right? And so if the king is being unfaithful, don't expect the people to be faithful, right? If the king is being faithful, well, there might be unfaithful people out there, but they're more motivated to be faithful. And so God says, I will discipline him. And these, this son will build a house for my name. 
And as you're reading through this, you can't help but wonder, is he talking about David's entire line? Or is he talking about a specific son to come from David? And this becomes even more intriguing as you continue to read through the next few books of the Bible. As you begin to realize that, yes, in general, God is acting as a father to David's sons in general. But there also seems to be this expectation that one day there will arise this chief son from the sons of David who will rule and reign forever, right? And his kingdom will have no end. Um, this person over time becomes known as the Messiah, right? The Mashiach in Hebrew. It means anointed one, right? All the kings of Israel were called Mashiachs, right? Because they were anointed, like they were anointed with oil. That was like part of the coronation ceremony. And so there are many Mashiachs, but as you're reading through it, you can't help but realize there's going to be one special capital M, Mashiach, one ultimate Messiah who will arrive from David's line. And that all ties back to this right here, right? So that shapes everything. Because now we know that David's like family line is set apart by God. And the seed that God promised to Abraham, who would bless the nations, is going to come from David. We continue reading. Um, David has a whole much, bunch more to his story, but for the sake of time, let's talk about his son Solomon. Solomon is the king who like, follows David, and Solomon never lived up to David's level of devotion to God, but he surpassed him in everything else. Um, Solomon grew up in a palace, right, because his dad was king. And early on in Solomon's reign, God shows up to him, and he says, hey, uh, Solomon, if I were to give you anything you asked for, what would you ask for? And Solomon says, Lord, what I would want is a hearing heart, right? I want a heart that hears what the people need and a discerning mind that knows how to govern these people. Because he says, God, my dad, he grew up in the shepherd's fields. He was a man of the people. He knew how to govern people. He says, I basically grew up with a silver spoon. I don't know how to take care of people. And so God, give me wisdom. And God is so impressed by that request that he says, you know what? You could have asked for anything. But since you asked for wisdom, I will give you not only wisdom, but I'll give you riches, fame, like anything. I'll give it all to you. And so Solomon, he literally leads the people of Israel into the golden age, right? Literally the golden age. In a second, we're going to talk about how much gold he had. There's a lot of gold, right? Solomon, he goes about these amazing building projects. He establishes peace throughout the land. His name literally means peace, Shlomo. It comes from the word Shalom, right? He is the king of peace. David was the warmonger who defeated Israel's enemies. Solomon is the one who reigns during this golden age of peace. Solomon is the one who builds the temple for God in Jerusalem. Uh, and that is Solomon's crowning achievement, right? He builds this temple. He dedicates it to God. And everything is going super duper great. He makes this amazing prayer where he just says, God, we are going to worship you forever. And everybody is echoing in the background saying, we will worship the Lord. We will worship the Lord. We will worship the Lord. And the screen cuts to black. And Morgan Freeman's voice comes over the loudspeaker. And he says, And they did not. They did not. Because Solomon... He is that example of Jeshurun growing fat and kicking, right? They're at the height of their prosperity, and Solomon is standing on top of the world. He is God's holy king, reigning from God's holy city, over God's holy people, in God's holy land, and he has got everything he could ever want. And he's so focused on looking down at all he's been given that he forgets to look up at God. Mm. And so ultimately, this is what we read. Now the weight of gold which came to Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold. Besides that, from the traders and the wares of the merchants and all the kings of the Arabs and the governors of the country. And King Solomon made 200 large shields of beaten gold using 600 shekels of gold on each large shield. And he made 300 shields of beaten gold using three minas of gold on each shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with refined gold. Uh-oh. What's the issue? What's the king doing? Multiplying gold. He's multiplying gold. And it's not like he's using it for good stuff. He's literally making gold shields and just hanging it on walls. They're not going out to battle. Also, gold shields wouldn't be useful for battle because gold is super, like, brittle, right? It just, like, fall apart. Mm -hmm. There's literally no practicality to a gold shield other than flexing that you have it, right? He literally just overlays his throne with gold so he can sit on gold. 
There's no point. He's doing exactly what the kings are not supposed to do. Uh-oh. Well, there were three things they weren't supposed to multiply. What were they? Horses. Yeah. Furious. Wives. And gold. Yeah. And metal. Like Warfare, gold. women, and wealth. Well, we got one of those. Let's keep reading. <laughs> That's strike one. And Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen and stationed them in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. Solomon's import of horses was from Egypt and Ku, and king's merchants procured them from Ku for a price. Uh-oh. Strike two. This is where it gets the worst of all. <laughs> Baffling. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women. Solomon clung to these in love, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And to nobody's surprise, his wives turned his heart away. Well, strike one, strike two, strike three. Well, according to the rules of baseball, You're out. Solomon's out. And so, sure enough, um, this is what happens. Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and give you ten tribes. Uh, ultimately, this is a, a prophet who is speaking to one of Solomon's workers, a guy named Jeroboam. Right? Uh, and this is in 1 Kings chapter 11. Right? So this is in, like we've now caught up to the book before the one we're going into. The prophet shows up to Jeroboam and he says, I will tear the kingdom, of Solomon, the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and give you ten tribes, but he will have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen from all the tribes of Israel because they have forsaken me. Nevertheless, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of my servant David whom I chose, who kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom from his son's hand and give it to you. The ten tribes. So ten tribes are going to go to Jeroboam. Two tribes are going to go to Solomon. Right? One tribe is the tribe of Judah. And then, so, like, the tribe of Judah going with him is just kind of understood. Right? That's why he doesn't mention it here. Right? He says ten and one. That's because Judah's going with Solomon no matter what. Right? There's eleven other tribes to pick from because there's twelve tribes of Israel. He says ten are going to go with Jeroboam. But then there's one other tribe that's going to go with Solomon. Which one is it? Do you remember? So the tribes are named after the sons of Jacob. So Judah is going to go with Solomon because Judah is the tribe that Solomon is from. So they're just naturally devoted to David's line. And then one other tribe is going to go. Somebody in this room has the name. Benjamin, Benjamin yes. Yeah, the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, and that's because the city of Jerusalem is located in the tribe of Benjamin. And so he says, well, since David chose Jerusalem, and since I love David, I decided Jerusalem is going to be the place where I dwell forever. And therefore, if Judah's going with David, then Benjamin's going with David too. Right? Um, and this actually is kind of cool, um, just like because it echoes the book of Genesis. If you remember, whenever Joseph was in Egypt, um, Judah offered himself in the place of Benjamin. Right? So Judah and Benjamin have this relationship. Um, but yeah, so right here we get to see that there's this prediction that ultimately um, the kingdom is going to be split. Uh, and basically God is going to give David the bare minimum, right? And that's because Solomon turned away. But God made a promise to David that he will not violate. He told David that no matter what, his kingdom is going to endure. And therefore, he's not going to just totally abandon them, right? If this were King Saul, he would have said, you know what? I'm just giving it to another. But he says, no, no, no. I'm going to be faithful to David. David's going to be reduced to two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. The other ten tribes are going with you, Jeroboam. And so, what happens next? Is that the kingdom is split in two. The two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, uh, they become known by the name of the larger of the tribes, Judah. Right? So the southern kingdom is known as Judah. The northern kingdom, which is the remaining ten tribes, they become known as Israel. Because, by and large, they are the rest of Israel. Right? <laughs> Uh, sometimes you'll hear them called Ephraim, and that is because Ephraim is the biggest of those tribes, right? So you've got Israel in the north, you've got Judah in the south. Uh, and like God said in the previous passage we just read, uh, ultimately, he doesn't do this during the reign of Solomon, 
right? Uh, and he says that that's not as a favor to Solomon. It's actually as a favor to David, right? Because, like, God just really loved David a whole lot. And so because David was such a good dude, he says, I'm not going to rip the kingdom away from Solomon during Solomon's life. But because of punishment for what Solomon does, the year he dies, fair game. Uh, and so this is what happens. Uh, ultimately, whenever Solomon's son Rehoboam becomes king, um, people come up to uh, Rehoboam, uh, like people from, like Jeroboam, you know, that's the one that the prophet went to. Um, he takes a group and they come before Rehoboam and they say, hey, here's the deal, dude. Near the end of your dad's reign, Solomon's reign, he was kind of oppressive and he was more tyrannical. And he started taxing us a whole lot and he started enslaving us quite a bit. And we, um, we were just kind of wanting to see, like, could you not do that? And keep in mind, Jeroboam already knows what God has told him is going to happen. But it seems like Jeroboam's just trying to make some peace. And he says, hey, we don't want to do this the hard way. We just want to ask, could you not be as much of a tyrant as your father? And Rehoboam, he goes and he talks to his advisors. He talks to his older advisors first. These are the ones who were advisors for Solomon. And they say, you know what? The people raise a fair point. Your dad was kind of tyrannical towards the end. Let's give them what they want. And let's just, you know, go a little easy on them so that they like you. But Rehoboam, he doesn't like that. That's not, you know, that doesn't feed his ego as much. What? You want my first act as king to be bowing to the will of the people? No. They need to know how tough I am. And so Rehoboam goes instead to his friends, the ones he grew up with, the ones who think like him. And he says, what do you think I should say? And they say this. Thus you shall say to this people who spoke to you, saying, your father made our yoke heavy. Now you make it lighter for us. Thus you shall speak to them. My little finger is thicker than my father's loins. So now my father loaded you with a heavy yoke, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So they say, nah, Rehoboam, you want to be a good king? You got to show them how tough you are, right? They make a crude joke, right? Oh, you thought my dad's little picky was big. Well, oh, you haven't seen what's between my legs. It's like, oh, um, yeah. Well, no, actually, no, sorry, flip that. He's saying that his little pinky is bigger than what was between his dad's legs, which is arguably grosser and weird. Um, basically, he's saying, like, you, you, you get the joke, right? This is a joke that men have been making their entire lives um, or throughout all human history. Um, and Rehoboam does it here. Is it fitting for a politician? No, but it's not beyond jokes that politicians make even to this day. Um, he says, you thought my dad made it bad? Well, you just buckle up. I'm going to make it worse. And Jeroboam says, all right, well, I apologize for not being clear. We were not making a request of you. We were making a demand. And if you do not give in to our demands, well, then we will simply leave. And so Jeroboam and the ten tribes of the north, they leave. They secede. And the kingdom is split in two, all because Rehoboam decided that his ego was a bit fragile and he wanted to prove a point. That's not, um, not great, but also this is punishment from God, right? And so this was going to happen either way. And so now you've got two kings reigning over two different nations, and it's even more confusing because both of their names end with Aboam. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, so you've got Jeroboam in the north, Rehoboam in the south, and this is where we get into the parts of First and Second Kings, which I said is very confusing, because as you read through the story, there are a whole lot of kings, right? Uh, you got the kingdom of Judah, which is going to last a significant amount longer than the kingdom of Israel, um, but both of them are ultimately going to be destroyed, right? So the split happens in 931 BC, right? It's the year that Solomon um, dies, uh, and ultimately Israel is going to last till 722 BC. Right? So that's just a little bit over uh, 200 years. Um, so basically, roughly the length that America has existed right now. Right, That's how long the northern kingdom of Israel is going to last. And then the Assyrians are going to come in and destroy them. We're going to read about that in 2 Kings. Right, The southern kingdom is going to actually last about 150 years longer than that. And they're not going to be destroyed until the Babylonians come in in 586 BC. One thing that you'll notice here is that despite the fact that Israel... Uh, Despite the fact that Judah lasted a lot longer than Israel, they both had roughly the same amount of kings, uh, which tells you that in general, things were a lot more politically unstable in Israel. 
Uh, because despite the fact that they only lasted about half the amount of time, they had the same amount of kings. Uh, and that's because whenever you look to the northern kingdom of Israel, these are all bad dudes. You'll notice that in this thing, um, the ones in blue, uh, those are the ones that the Bible describes as doing what is right in the eyes of God. Uh, you'll notice that most of the people are not in blue. And in the kingdom of Israel, not a single one is in blue. Another thing you need to know is that whenever you look at the kingdom of Israel, you are dealing with nine different dynasties, right? Uh, dynasties are basically like, you know, families that rule, right? Um, so there's going to be like Jeroboam and Nadab. You know, Nadab is Jeroboam's son. But then Baasha is one of Nadab's commanders who comes in and kills him and takes over, right? And that's going to happen a bunch in the northern kingdom of Israel. In Judah, though, that is one dynasty, right? It is the Davidic dynasty descended from David, right? So David had Solomon. Solomon had Rehoboam. Rehoboam had Abijah. Abijah had Asa. Asa had Jehoshaphat. That is all one family line, and that is because God is faithful. If we're talking about how First and Second Kings is structured, uh, that's basically where you see the dividing lines, right? First Kings is what you see in red there. It goes from Rehoboam to Abijah to Asa to Jehoshaphat, and then uh, it also covers Jeroboam, Nadab, Baasha, Elah, Zimri, Omri, and Ahab. That's where we left off in First Kings. Going into Second Kings, we're going to talk about all these other things, but there's still more we need to talk about. Because we're going to do something a little bit different as we go through 2 Kings. Because we're going to take little breaks along the way. Because one cool thing that happens as you get into this latter part of 2 Kings is that God is going to begin to send more prophets to get on to the people of Israel and Judah and to the other nations. And so what we see is that at this time period, there are several different prophets that go and write books and do different things. Right? We've already seen one of them in 1 Kings. Right? You see Elijah right there? On the top? Well, he was ministering to the people of Israel from about 870 to 845 BC. That is where we are going to be picking up in 2 Kings. The first two chapters of 2 Kings, they kind of wrap up Elijah's story. And then they go into the story of Elisha, or Elisha, right? Elijah's protege. And we're going to talk about him a lot in 2 Kings as well. But you'll also notice that over the course of the following years, You've got people like Obadiah, Jonah, Nahum, Hosea, Amos, Joel, Micah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zephaniah, Habakkuk. Well, they're all going to be showing up, and they're going to be ministering to the people during this time period. So as we go through 2 Kings, there are going to be some weeks where I say, hey guys, we're going to hit the pause button on Kings, and we're going to spend this week doing an overview of this prophet. We're not going to do like an in-depth, verse-by-verse thing, uh, mainly because, I mean, the book of Isaiah is 66 chapters long, right? That would be way too long of a pause button. But what I want to do is I want to help you understand where in the context of kings these prophets fall so that on your own time, you can go and study these and you'll be able to interpret them in light of 2 Kings. Does that make sense? And so we're going to be doing that along the way as well. Uh, And then who knows, maybe somewhere down the road, we will go through some of these prophets like verse by verse, uh, but just not right now, right? So we'll go through 2 Kings verse by verse, uh, and then we'll do every few weeks or something like that. Whenever we get to a point in the story where these prophets show up, we'll be like, hey, Uh, Let's do one or two weeks just covering Isaiah, something like that. All right. Uh, I do have a few more charts that I do want to show you here uh, just to kind of begin to close this stuff up. Right here, um, here are um, the kings of Judah, right? Uh, And as you can see, I put all the references here, uh, and we've only covered the first four of them in 1 Kings, right? You've got Rehoboam, Abijah, Asa, and Jehoshaphat. We've already talked about those four. And then over the course of 2 Kings, we're going to have all these other guys to talk about, uh, which should communicate to you right off the bat that 2 Kings is not going to be any less confusing than 1 Kings. Because there are a lot of names there, and I'm going to be honest with you, I don't expect you to remember all of these. right? Um, I expect you to remember Saul, David, Solomon, maybe even Rehoboam. And there might be a few people like Josiah that you should probably remember. But some of them... Like, it seems like one of the points that the author is trying to make is that these guys were forgettable, right? They reigned for so many years, yet they didn't accomplish that much other than just leading the people back into sin. You can also see right here on the side, I did put the different prophets who showed up at this time period, and that can kind of roughly let you know when we might be going into these books, right? I mean, Obadiah, that's 2 Kings chapter 8, roughly, right? We, don't, we actually don't know if, like a for sure date for Obadiah, but that's people's best guess. And so, around the time we get to 2 Kings 8, I'll say, hey, let's go through Obadiah. The cool thing is that we might actually be able to do verse by verse through Obadiah, because it's only one chapter long. So, 
if we're setting aside a week to go through it, might as well, right? Uh, and so, as we go through it, you can see roughly where we're probably going to be going through these prophets, because that's roughly where they fall. All right? But I also want, just for the sake of context, let's talk a little bit about the kings that we've covered so far, right? We're going to look at the kings of Judah first, then the kings of Israel, and then we'll be done, right? I know I said I was going to talk a lot, and I have been talking a lot. In the future, it'll be more discussion-based, but I was trying to get us through all of this. All right, so the kings we've covered so far, uh, we already talked about Rehoboam, so we don't have to cover him, which means that there are three more kings of Judah that we already covered in 1 Kings. Let's just recap them a little bit, right? One of their names is Abijah, uh, who is also known, I think in 1 Kings, he's called Abijah Muk, right? Same person. He's mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 15. Uh, he only reigned for a very short amount of time, right? Just a few years. And this guy was the son of Rehoboam. We don't know much about him other than the fact that he was evil in the eyes of Yahweh and uh, he was at war with Jeroboam for his entire reign. Remember, Jeroboam is ultimately the, um, like he was the first king of Israel, right? He's like whenever they split up, Jeroboam was that king. So after Rehoboam dies, uh, Abijah takes over and the only thing we know about him is that he was constantly at war with the northern kingdom. Beyond that, we know practically nothing, right? He literally is given eight verses and that's it. After that comes Asa. Asa is the son of Abijah, uh, and he is the one who, if you go back to the previous slide, um, you'll notice that he is in green, and that's because he does what is right in the eyes of Yahweh. He put away the cult prostitutes and the idols, and he deposed his grandmother as the queen mother, uh, but there's one thing he did not do, and he did not remove the high places, right? High places at this time period are basically pagan shrines that people built to other gods. And so Asa, in general, did a lot of really good stuff, but... He wasn't perfect, right? He didn't go all the way, but still the Bible says that he was wholly devoted to God. Uh, while fighting Baasha, king of Israel, he did make a treaty with Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, and God did not like that very much. And so towards the end of Asa's reign, he did have some missteps, um, but the Bible still says that he was devoted to Yahweh all his days, right? So he might not have always made the wisest decisions, and God didn't like him making a treaty with a foreign ally, but um, nevertheless... Um, he still goes down as one of Israel's better, or Judah's better kings. Good? Uh, also, it's been six months. If this stuff doesn't even sound familiar to you, I don't blame you, right? Um, because we covered these verses, but it's been a while. Uh, all right, then there's Jehoshaphat, right? This is the final king that we saw at the very end of 1 Kings chapter 22, right? And first, like, there's only 22 chapters in 1 Kings. So this was the last king of Judah that we heard about in 1 Kings. He was the son of Asa. And he also did what was right in the eyes of Yahweh. Um, like Asa, his father, he did not remove the high places, but he actually did manage to make peace with the king of Israel at that time, uh, which is something that the others hadn't done, right? They had been at war with Jeroboam and his son and Baasha, but Jehoshaphat actually managed to make uh, peace with Ahab. Uh, ultimately, he does fight with Ahab uh, in the battle where Ahab was ultimately killed. Uh, you probably do remember that story because that's where Micaiah the sassy prophet shows up. Uh, if you remember, um, basically Ahab talks with Jehoshaphat uh, and he says, hey, we want to go fight these guys. And Jehoshaphat says, okay, cool, but can we like inquire of the prophets of Yahweh first? And Ahab's like, oh, you want to talk to some prophets? Sure. And all the prophets show up and they say, y'all are going to win the battle. And Jehoshaphat says, um, no, I wanted to talk to prophets of Yahweh, not just any prophet. Do you have a prophet who actually worships God? And Ahab's like, oh, there's this one prophet, but he never says anything good. So they call forward Micaiah. And Micaiah says, oh, yeah, you're going to win the battle. And Ahab's like, really? And Micaiah's like, nah, dude, you're screwed. <laughs> and uh, basically he predicts that Ahab's going to die. And if you remember in the story, Jehoshaphat actually disguised himself as Ahab uh, going into the battle. Uh, but then whenever people start firing him, he's like, bro, I ain't Ahab, right? I'm just, I'm the other dude. And they're like, oh, okay. And then Ahab ends up accidentally getting shot. Like, like, the, like somebody literally accidentally shoots an arrow and it kills Ahab. They weren't even aiming for him. Uh, and that's just like the providence of God because God said he was going to die, right? Uh, so Jehoshaphat, he was in that battle, right? And that's about all we know, right? That is where 1 Kings ends in regards to the kingdom of Judah. But because 1 and 2 Kings is so complex, we're not simply dealing with the, kings, uh, the kingdom of Judah. We're also dealing with the kingdom of Israel, and this is where we get these. You'll notice I do have different colors of red there. 
Um, that's not suggesting that certain ones were worse than others. I simply have it marked off by dynasties, right? So Jeroboam and Nadab, that is from the dynasty of Jeroboam. Nadab is Jeroboam's son. Then you have Baasha, who is one of the commanders who kills Nadab, and he takes over. And then Elah is his son. And then Zimri is a commander who kills Elah and takes over. And then Omri is a commander who kills Zimri and takes over. That's kind of how it worked back then. I'm kind of glad that's not how yeah. politics work here, yeah. where it's like if you like killed the political leader, you are now that person. Like, like I'm glad that's not how it works. But back in that day, they did it that way because basically if you were able to kill the king, people viewed that as like God's seal of approval that you deserve to rule. Which is may, probably a twisted way of thinking, but, I mean, that's kind of how it was. Uh, and so, typically, it's like, if you wanted to be king, all you had to do was, like, kill the other dude. And you're like, alright, cool, I made it. Uh, and so, these are these guys, and you can see that we did cover a lot more of them, right? We actually covered, I think, that's seven of them? Wait, no, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. eight. Uh, oh, I, there's, I, I literally have numbers right next to it. I should have just looked at that. So, we've covered eight of them. Um... But we've already talked about one already. We already talked about Jeroboam. So let's pick up with Jeroboam's son, Nadab. Right? Nadab, we'll read about him in 1 Kings chapter 15. He was the son of Jeroboam. And as you will see with every single one of these guys, he's evil in the sight of Yahweh. Like there's not a single king from the northern kingdom of Israel who is ever devoted to Yahweh. Every single one of them worships idols. Uh, and that's because that's what Jeroboam did. If you remember, once Jeroboam became king, one of the first things he did was build golden calves to lead the people into a new religious form of worship. And God's just like, really, dude? Like, come on. Uh, and so Nadab is evil in the eyes of Yahweh. Uh, ultimately, he is killed by Baasha, one of his captains, while besieging the Philistine town of Gebethan. Uh, and he only reigns, as you can tell, for about a year. So uh, he doesn't really accomplish much. Uh, Baasha, uh, he actually reigns for a much longer amount of time. So he was originally the captain of Nadab's army, uh, and he murdered Nadab, and not only Nadab, but the entire house of Jeroboam, right? Just to make sure that, you know, like, if you don't kill the rest of Jeroboam's house, what's going to happen? They're going to rise up, kill you, and take over again. So he made sure that all Jeroboam's family was wiped out, which actually was the fulfillment of prophecy given by God. God said that Jeroboam's family would get wiped out. Uh, Baasha did ally himself with Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, which, if you remember, that's the guy we talked about with the kings of Judah, right? That's the one that Asa allied himself with. Uh, but whenever he warred against Asa, the king of Judah, uh, Ben-Hadad betrayed him. Uh, because, like I mentioned, Asa made the treaty with Ben-Hadad. Uh, and so, uh, since Asa and Ben-Hadad made that treaty, Ben-Hadad decided to betray Baasha, uh, and that ultimately backfired, and Baasha lost a lot of land. To where basically, I'm pretty sure the Arameans covered, like, conquered most of Galilee at that point. Um, the destruction of his dynasty was foretold by the prophet Jehu, uh, and so ultimately... From that point forward, you're just waiting for Baasha's line to end. Elah, uh, he was Baasha's son, and he did reign, but he did not last very long. Uh, he was slain by a guy named Zimri, who was the commander of half of his chariots, uh, and this happened while he was drunkenly partying at a feast in Tirza. Uh, you might remember that, to where literally the guy like goes to, like he's just like at a party, like getting drunk, and Zimri comes in and just kills him. It's like okay, cool. Uh, you get the idea that this guy was not really king material. Um, he just wanted to party. And so that is Elah. Which then leads us to Zimri. And Zimri, this guy. Oh my gosh. Zimri, Zimri, Zimri. <sighs> you thought it was bad that he, um, you know, you thought it was bad that the previous guy got murdered during a party until you hear about Zimri. Because Zimri was evil. He reigns for one week. That's it. One week long. He lasts one week. Because when the army declared... oh, like So basically what happens is that the rest of the kingdom of Israel hears that Zimri has murdered Elah and declared himself king. And nobody likes that. Like nobody wants Zimri to be king. And so literally the army says, he's not our king. And they declare Omri king. And Zimri apparently figures out that he stands no ch chance against Omri. Because Omri leads, like, basically he lays siege to the town of Tirzah, and Zimri realizes, oh, I stand no chance. And so literally one week after declaring himself king, he literally goes into Basha and Elah's palace and just burns it down on top of himself and just commits suicide. Oh. Like, it is, like, it is so pathetic and sad that it's almost humorous in a dark way. 
Um, but it just serves to show how politically like destitute the kingdom has become at this point. Like this dude, literally, like he's so power hungry, he's willing to kill a king while the dude's at a party, and then one week later, he's built burning a house down on himself. That, that's just embarrassing, right? But that's what the kingdom's like at this point. Omri, he lasts a little bit longer because Omri is the one that everybody wanted to be king, right? Uh, he was the commander of Elah's army. He's the commander that everybody chose to make king in place of Zimri. Uh, and he was also evil in the sight of Yahweh. Uh, and it says that he was more evil than anyone else who'd come before him. Uh, he was declared king over a guy named Tibni. Uh, basically, it seems like at this time period, there were just a bunch of people vying for the throne. Everybody wanted Omri. Nobody wanted Zimri. And then there was this other guy named Tibni who did like have like part, like a partial claim. But ultimately, Omri's the one who won out. Um, and Omri's big claim to fame is that he is the one who built and established the city of Samaria, which going forward is going to be the capital of the northern kingdom, right? So you've got Jerusalem and Judah, you've got Samaria and Israel, which is going to be the kingdom. Uh, according to scripture, he walked in the ways of Jeroboam, which is basically a way of saying that he promoted idolatry, right? That was his thing. Uh, and so the Omri dynasty uh, goes down in history as basically like the most corrupt dynasty in all of Israel's history ever. His son Ahab, believe it or not, is even worse. Ahab's going to reign for about 20 years, but we spend a whole long time with Ahab, right? You'll notice that Zimri gets like five verses. Omri gets about seven verses. Ahab, he's chapter 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22, right? So we learn a lot about Ahab. He's one of those names you probably want to remember. Uh, and he's easy to remember because of his wife, Jezebel, the princess of the Sidonians, right? Um... If you're wanting to, if you're trying to figure out who's wearing the pants in the family, it, it's definitely Jezebel, yeah. right? Ahab is more like this political puppet who just kind of does whatever his wife wants, uh, and he's more like a whiny baby who just like, um, whenever you read the end of First Kings, he's constantly throwing fits because he doesn't get what he wants, and then Jezebel, she's like, oh, you my weed, your husband, have a good difficult day, don't you worry, I'll get you what you want, <laughs> uh, and he's like, really, and that, that's kind of how the relationship goes, <laughs> to where both of them are really corrupt. But Jezebel is, she, she's really like the leader of the corruption here. Uh, and we've even talked about the parallel between Ahab and Jezebel and Herod and Herodias when you get to the New Testament. So um, he took Jezebel, Sidonian princess, as his wife. Uh, he made the Asherah. Like, so Asherah, or those are like poles that people would worship. Uh, and he also built an altar for Baal in Samaria. And he built a temple for Baal in Samaria. Uh, so this dude, he took the capital that his father built and he made it a shrine to Baal who is the, you know, the god that Jezebel would have worshipped. Um, he had several run-ins with the prophet Elijah, who predicted a drought wrought by Ahab's sins, and he criticized Ahab for murdering Naboth to acquire his vineyard. Uh, technically, it was Jezebel who had Naboth murdered, and that was because Ahab really wanted the vineyard. That was one of those times where Ahab was throwing a fit. He's like, I went and asked this guy for this vineyard, and he wouldn't give it to me. And Jezebel's like, honey, sit back, I'll take care of it. Uh, and so Elijah, he gets on to Ahab quite a bit. Uh, ultimately, uh, Ahab, he's the one who does achieve peace with Jehoshaphat. Uh, and he is mortally wounded by an unnamed arrow in battle, and dogs lick up the blood from his corpse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah no. uh, and so that is how 1 Kings almost ends. But the way that 1 Kings actually ends is with um, one of the most abrupt endings in any book ever. Uh, and to be fair... I don't know why it ends like this, because we talked about this in the past. Originally, First and Second Kings was one book, right? It was just the book of Kings. But later on, like, so if you look at, like, a Jewish, like, a Hebrew Bible, they'll call it just Kings. But for some reason, in our Christian Bibles, we've split it up into two. And I get why we did that with Samuel, right? Because First Samuel is kind of like the rise of David, and then, like, Second Samuel is like the reign of David. So that makes sense. I do not know why they split First Kings where they did. To me, and we talked about this last time, right? Like like six months ago, I I, vent, like, I, I just like, ranted about this for a while. To me, it makes more sense to end First Kings chapter twenty two at verse fifty, and to start Second Kings, where verse fifty one is right here, because First Kings ends by talking about the beginning of Ahaziah's reign, and then it just cuts off in the middle of it, and then Second Kings just like continues. I don't know what people were thinking whenever they divided this book. But they did it in a weird way. And so this is the immediate context that's going to lead us into 2 Kings. We read this. Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, became king over Israel and Samaria 
in the seventeenth year of Jehoshaphat king of Judah, and he reigned two years over Israel. And he did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh, and walked in the way of his father, and in the way of his mother, and in the way of Jeroboam son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin. So he served Baal, and worshipped him, and provoked Yahweh, the God of Israel, to anger, according to all that his father had done. And that is how 1 Kings ends. It literally just begins to tell you about this guy, and then it says, the end, come back next time. And for us, next time is six months. Uh, but uh, starting next week, we will jump into 2 Kings. We will begin with chapter 1, um, because that is the most fitting place to begin. I don't know why we start in chapter 7. Um, so we'll begin with 2 Kings chapter 1, and we will just continue to see what is going on with the story. Uh, and it will be quite the doozy, but um, we're going to get through it. Thank you all for dealing with me talking for a while. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning that I was not feeling very good and that my throat was kind of scratchy. And I can confirm to you that now, after having talked for two hours, my throat is officially sore and I feel terrible. But uh, that's all right. Uh, we should be good. Um, do you all have anything you all want to add or anything that you want to highlight from the story of Scripture that maybe I didn't address that might be worth mentioning before we close up? Yeah, basically this long, like this whole section of scripture is just teaching us a long lesson of what not to do. Like basically most people, I feel like David, like everybody, you're like, yeah, I'm just not going to do that. Yeah. Uh, and also just to constantly remember, uh, we're not as strong as we think we are. Right. Uh, you know, that, that's like the running joke. Every time I recap the Bible, I'm always like, they say, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Cut to black. They did not. Uh, that is really just the story of the Bible. Uh, people constantly overestimate their faith. Uh, and that's true with Christians too, right? Think of Peter. Think of all the apostles, right? I mean, this is what we do. Why, we think we are more faithful than we are. And unfortunately, usually it's only whenever we're confronted by the depths of our depravity that we begin to actually realize how sinful we really are. I think it's better for us to just acknowledge our sinfulness early on so that we don't have to be surprised by it later. But yeah, so there's our little practical word of advice uh, after all of that stuff. One of y'all want to close this out in prayer? Since I already talked enough. Go for it, Maverick. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, I pray to you that um, that what we went through, um, that we um, just don't hug ourselves up with the knowledge, but we learn how to look at ourselves and to judge ourselves before we judge others. And um, also when we go over um, Second Kings, um, if it's David or if it's David, Sean, or if it's David, Sean, and George, like just whoever goes through those chapters, that they lean on to you for guidance and that you will have us talk when we need to talk or have a silent when we have to be silent to understand your word more deep and more like the way you want it to. And Lord Jesus, um, there's a lot that can distract us from you in this world, like um, if it's a political thing or a war going on, um, that we don't look at those and lose our faith because of those. We actually need to strengthen our faith and not worry about what election's going on and what war's going on. Because at the end of the day, we know, we know where the story ends. And um, that's what we need to apply in <coughs> each day, is where the story is going to end. And not in the now and get all freaked out. I say this. In your name, in your name alone. Amen. Amen.